from the Arc of King County's Healthy Relationships Program. Oh my gosh, so sorry. I was reading oh, <laughs> the wrong We love DRW. Thing. We do too. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we, we'll tell you a little bit more about our program at the end, but the work that we do is centered around sexual assault prevention. We do education and work for people with developmental disabilities and the people that support them around being safe and healthy in our relationships. Um, so, yeah, Will you two question. speak directly into your microphone? Sure. Um, okay. Here, I'm going to go to the next slide and I'm actually going to go get um, a speakerphone that I think will make us a little bit louder. Okay, thank you so much. So while Claire is doing that, we are going to have a little bit of time to reflect on what our personal relationship is with disability. Um, I think that we all um, will certainly know someone in our lives, whether that's ourselves or a family member, a friend, a coworker who has a disability. And disability can be a really broad, um, really broad topic. So I'd encourage you to um, think like expansively about what that means. This could be a temporary disability, like a injury or a um, developmental disability. Um, and I just like would love for you guys to think as we begin this um, presentation about what your relationship to disability is in general and those people in your lives who live with disability. Yeah, I just want to check in really fast. I just plugged in a different microphone. Can folks hear us a little bit better? You sound great. Awesome, thank you. Okay. Okay, so we're going to be talking a little bit about disability today. We're going to be talking about intellectual and developmental disability and what that looks like. Um, then we're going to talk a little bit about sexuality for people with disabilities and sort of how that's different from non disabled people and how that's all the same. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about sort of domestic violence and sort of what that looks like from a disability lens. Um, and we're going to talk about the prevalence of caregiver abuse um, and sexual assault. And then we're going to talk about sort of how to support people with disabilities who have experienced trauma and who have experienced interpersonal violence. Um, and sort of what that might look like for people with disabilities and how that's the same and how that's going to be different for, from non-disabled people. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about what we do here at the Arc of King County around sexual assault prevention and we want to leave lots of time at the end for questions. Um, okay, so the first thing that we're going to talk about is what is disability? Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I wanted to walk us through some models of disability. And the reason why this is important is that the beliefs we have about disability affect the way we interact with people who have a disability. And these are beliefs that are uh, present in our society. And I think we all have en encountered all of these um, in our lives. And I think that if we don't know that we have them, they can come out in ways that are, um, like they can inform us in ways that might be hurtful or helpful. Uh, but we won't be aware of them. So I want to put some words and some examples to how we talk about and think about disability in our society. Um, and we're going to go through all four of these, um, starting with the ones on the left, like the moral model, that's probably the most pathologizing. And then the interpretation of disability gets more positive all the way to the inspiration model, which is kind of like an over romantic, like overly romanticizing disability. So we're going to talk about some of the like, yeah, the different ways that those manifest. All right, so the moral model, this kind of has two aspects to it. There's the part of uh, the moral model that's about uh, disability being like evil, a sign of um, like, like a flaw in the person or a, like a fault of the parents. Maybe like they were sinful, maybe this is like the result of their actions or the person who has the disabilities actions. And this can be seen in the media. We have a lot of villains who are like physically um, disabled and that is like seen as a sign, like a visual sign that they're like a bad person. And the other part of the moral model is about um, providing charity. So like it's about this person is very like pitiable. Um, and so the people who help them are like, doing it because they feel bad and they feel sorry for this person who's like a burden on society. And so how that ends up playing out is there's a lot of isolation and segregation of people that we don't 
because if we view people with disabilities as like bad, then we want to push them away from our society and they're not going to receive support. But this, if they do receive support, it's going to be like charity. It's going to be uh, support that is designed to make the person providing the support feel good about themselves um, and not support designed to make the person with the disability um, feel good about themselves. Yeah, um, so I think one way that this shows up uh, in our work is, you know, um, I think a common thing you'll hear sometimes from people that work with people with disabilities is that they'll describe their clients as like a gift from God, or they'll say, you know, that they're doing God's work by doing caregiving or by supporting people with disabilities. And so like Wesley said, it's, it's sort of this model of viewing disability that really serves to make people who support people with disabilities feel good about themselves um, and is ultimately um, kind of dehumanizing or objectifying. So let me interrupt. Yeah. Okay, so the next model is the medical model. Um, in this model, this is probably the most pervasive model in our society. This is the model that like our healthcare system is based on, our education system is based on this model. The idea is that if you have a disability, that is like a deficit or a flaw, but we're gonna provide you help. We're gonna fix you. We're gonna make it better. Do this intervention, Take like complete this therapeutic program. You're gonna be able to fit in with society just fine. Um, and so, what that tells the person with a disability is that there's something like fundamentally broken or wrong with them and their disability and the way their body is and the way their brain is in society. And um, it, sends, it ends up sending a really negative message that they need to be putting forth a lot of effort to appear like everyone else and fit in with mainstream society. And um, I just want to say that like the medical model is not like entirely bad. Like I'm not trying to say medicine is bad or like providing intervention to people with disabilities is bad. Um, it's that framework of how the intervention is provided. Um, so if the goal is to fix the person with the disability, to force them to hide their disability, that's sending them a really negative message. But if the goal of the medical intervention is to support them, then that's sending a really positive message of like, we want you to be included in our society, so we're going to provide you the medical care you need to do that. Um, yeah, and I just wanted to uh, point out this. Um, ad that's very upsetting that says let's wipe out cancer diabetes and autism in his lifetime and it shows a picture of a young boy um, this was like relatively recent mm -hmm. um, from the Seattle Children's um, Research Institute which I just think um, shows a lot of how our society in like a very mainstream culture way um, uses like this medicalizing model to be very harmful All right, next up we have the social model. Um, this is the model that we at the Art of King County want to work from. Um, it believes that disability is just another form of human diversity, like all other forms of human diversity, and that people with disabilities should be empowered and accommodated and welcomed into society. Um, it focuses on the strengths of the person with the disability and places the onus on the society to create spaces and accommodations to allow that person to be involved and not on the person with the disability to fix themselves so that they can um, be a part of society. Um, yeah, I really like these comics. I think they're really, um, they really exemplify what this model means. I really like the one where um, in the upper right, where there's um, someone pointing to a sign that says normality training, how to stop upsetting people by looking disabled. And uh, the disabled person is replying, be normal, what makes you think we'd want to lower our standards? And I think that that like pride and confidence about being a person with a disability in society um, is what I hope all people with disabilities are able to have. Okay. The last model of these four is the inspiration model. Um, it's closely related to the moral model where there's a lot of that idea of like, this person is a gift from God, they're so special and um, they're like, a, like an angel or like they're such a blessing in my life. But um, the person who is saying those things is saying them in a way that isn't like, I love and care about this person in my life. They're saying them in a way that like dehumanizes the person. It turns that person from like a whole human being with like multiple dimensions and personality traits and goals and aspirations into like some, like almost like an object that is inspiring to them. So you see this a lot, like this inspiration poster with uh, young um, 
young person with prosthetics who's running, um, which is just like a normal thing that kids do. But um, they've written, but seriously though, what's your excuse on the poster? As if this person who's just out enjoying their life is somehow doing something like phenomenal. Um, yeah, and so it's taking, it's taking the like ordinary things that people with disabilities do and saying like, wow, I can't believe anyone with a disability could do that. Um, and that's like, what you're actually saying when you said is you have incredibly low expectations for what people with disabilities can do with their lives. Um, and that's really demeaning for the person to hear. Like no one wants to be patted on the back for doing like the most basic things in life. That feels insincere. Um, and so this, this image in the upper right has a really, um, good message. It says, don't be surprised when she gets her driver's license, graduates from high school, goes to prom, gets married, gets a job or achieves her dreams. Be supportive, be encouraging, be proud, but don't be surprised. And I think that that's that distinction because we want, we want to support the people with disabilities in our lives, but we want to do it in a way that lifts them up and honors them as like whole humans. Yeah. Um, I think that if, if thinking about disability from these models is, is new for you, I think that this can be kind of an over, can, can feel a little bit overwhelming. I think that what we ask and what disability activists are asking is that we view disability as a lived experience and as an identity that people have pride in. And so that social model is sort of a, a way to really kind of view people's identities as valid and think about, you know, how do we how do we accommodate people so that they can live their fullest lives um, in a way that isn't trying to change them or fix them or, or kind of dehumanize them in some way? Um, so, yeah, I'm curious if what 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 people's thoughts are on this, um, and if we want to take a moment to just kind yeah. of share thoughts or, or if you have any questions about this before we move forward. You know, we kind of dumped a lot of information on you. Um, okay. I don't know, it feels pretty quiet, so I think we'll keep moving. <laughs> okay, well, if you have questions about this, feel free to, to deposit them and we'll get to them at the end. All right, so there's one more model that I want to talk about. Ooh, yeah, yeah, I absolutely can do that. Um, we're going to go back yes. to this. Yes, um, thank you. So <laughs> one of the things is that um, in this, in this, in this um, ad, autism is a way that people's brains are for life. So if someone is born with autism, they're gonna have an autistic brain their whole entire life and there's nothing that's gonna change that. That's just how they are as a person. So when you say, let's wipe out autism in the lifetime of a child, like the only way to do that is to kill all autistic people. Um, and if you're, what you're trying to say instead is, let's have no more autistic people be born ever. Like that's saying that like, you're going to like somehow figure out how to like selectively remove those people from the population, which hopefully from the way that this is going, like what I'm saying, you're thinking like eugenics, like that's bad. Like we've, we've been over this as a society. Hopefully we're not gonna try it again. Um, trying to like selectively choose who gets to exist in our society is really, really, really problematic. Yeah, I also think that um, we can sort of parse out the difference between um, disabilities and, and neurodivergence and illnesses. So, I mean, I think most people would agree that we want to get rid of cancer and that people that have cancer don't want to have cancer and we want to eradicate that. Um, but autism is, um, is an identity that a lot of people are really proud of. And so are a lot of disabilities. And so to me, I think if you were to replace the word autism with another identity group, you know, um, especially another minority, we would all find that very horrifying, um, I hope. So that's sort of, I think when, when autistic people see ads saying like, let's eradicate your existence, that's sort of kind of what it's triggering for them is that, that idea of like, okay, but I, I'm okay with this part of who I am. It's the world that's not okay with, with who I am. Um, yeah, I hope that provides some clarification. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not to say that there aren't parts of autism that are very difficult for people to live with. And they're mm -hmm. like, wow, I wish I didn't have this like terrible reaction to this sensory stimuli, but the like on a whole, that's the message it sends. Yeah. Thank you for asking. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Now we're going to talk about the minority stress model. Um, this is a model that's uh, also been talked about in other um, disciplines um, when we're talking about 
groups that are minorities in society. And basically it's just a reminder that a lot of the difficulties faced by people with disability aren't necessarily a part of their disability. There are things that society puts on them because of their disability. So this can be things like discrimination, um, mental illness, isolation, bullying, and systemic poverty. If you have, like, if you're deaf and you can't get a job because no one is willing to give you accommodations at work, or if you're underemployed because you can't work in the field you would like because no one is willing to give you accommodations and you're experiencing more poverty than like a person who's not deaf would. That's like part of the systemic poverty that's built into disability that has nothing to do with whether that person is like wanting to work or able to work. It's about the system around them that's preventing them from being a full part of society. Um, and people that live with this in like people with disabilities live in a world that's not made to support them and that can be very traumatic. So it's really best practice to um, work with people assuming that they have a trauma history because like you're not going to do any harm by making the assumption and doing the best practices for working with someone with a trauma history but if you don't do that you might end up um, re-traumatizing them so yeah um so i mean there's a lot of research that supports this idea that people with developmental disabilities experience really high rates of trauma. Um, as someone who works with young adults with developmental disabilities, I also just want to say anecdotally that that's something I see in my work all the time. Um, I see students that are young, you know, that are about 20 years old, and they are have clearly got so much lived experience of people trying to fix them and um, change them and tell them that they need to be different or better um, and and I think it's really hard to overstate the harm that that can do to someone um, okay so we've talked a little bit about uh, kind of how the world treats people with disabilities we wanted to talk a little bit about sort of what um, developmental disabilities are so sort of officially speaking if you're applying to get services from the government um, they are for, for having a developmental disability they're going to be looking at your iq and they're going to be looking at your adaptive skills and those are basically tests that that assign a number value to your intellect um, and so there's kind of some harsh sort of black and white uh, that exists there but in general people with developmental disabilities experience challenges around communication and socialization um, so a lot of uh, folks with developmental disabilities you might work with might have a processing delay they might need a, a little bit extra time after you finish speaking to process what you've said and to, to respond um, the people that you work with that have developmental disabilities might have um, sensory sensory needs they might be really sensitive to stimuli um, such that things like fluorescent lighting or kind of white noise things that um to like not people that are not sensitive to sensory stuff it, you might not even think about it but just stuff um making eye contact bright lights loud noises those are all things that can be challenging for people with developmental disabilities um, Similarly, understanding cause and effect, um, understanding sort of figurative language can be difficult with people with disabilities. They can be very literal um, and they can have a hard time with nuance sometimes. Um, and a lot of people with developmental disabilities have some issues with self-regulation um, and kind of coping. So that's something that a lot of folks that, that we work with, especially younger people, um, can kind of have more challenges around that, that stuff. So there's sort of extra support that's needed around managing that. Um, so those are some things that you might be thinking about. Oh, the last thing I wanna say is that a lot of people with developmental disabilities struggle with executive functioning. So um, they might need help, a little bit more support, scheduling appointments, making sure that they're getting where they need to go. Um, it's worth saying that like, people with developmental disabilities are not a monolith so like some of this might apply to, to the people you're working with and some of it might not um, it's just all stuff to be thinking about um, so that's sort of what it, what working with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities might look like and we all want to talk a little bit about autism specifically um, so I'm going to pass that over to Wesley yeah, so this um, this list of, this description of what autism is comes from the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network. 
um, and they have a very like um, uh, positive focus. So they their list includes things like experiencing sensory experiences differently. Um, and one of the things that might be relevant for you if you're working with autistic people in like an office space is that fluorescent lights are often very um, difficult for people with with autism to uh, deal with because they're like bright and flickering. Um, and then things like smell, perfume, and and um, like scented hand soap or scented lotion might um, be causing a bigger bigger reaction than you might expect from someone who has autism. Um, there are also different ways of learning, different uh, like depths of interest in specific areas, which can definitely be a strength, but can also uh, be something that neurotypical people find a little bit uh, frustrating because that person wants to talk about one thing all the time. <laughs> uh, and then this next bullet is atypical and sometimes repetitive movement. So I think a lot of people are familiar with the hand flapping, um, but this could also be smaller things like fidgeting with like a pen or tapping their foot or something like pacing um, or, rocking. or rocking. Those things all are ways that autistic people express their emotions. So happiness, sadness, anxiety, um, and also help regulate their body because their different sensory experiences mean that um, more, sometimes more sensory input is needed to help them stay regulated. So if someone is rocking or flapping, um, it's really good to let them continue doing that and maybe check in with them, like, how are you feeling? But um, generally just like they're expressing themselves and uh, this is not like dangerous for them or anyone else, um, usually. There's also a need for consistency, routine, and order, which um, makes working with people who are autistic um, it helps to have like very clear outlines of what's happening when so that they can expect what's going on. Um, there can also be difficulties with communication, um, especially nonverbal language. So it's best um, to say what you mean, and not, not make a lot of um, like sarcastic jokes because that can often go over people's heads. Um, yeah, and their expression might be different. They might have a typing device, they might use sign language, um, or the way in which they speak might involve like repeating things that you say. Um, just give a person time to um, communicate with you in the way that they know how. Yeah. Um, I guess this is a good time to check in. Are there any questions now before we kind of keep, we're gonna move next into talking about sexuality for people with disabilities. So I guess for now, are there any questions sort of about what disability looks like? Okay. It's like hard to, I don't think you can tell if someone's typing, so we'll just kind of keep going and if we see a message pop up, we'll go back. Um, okay, so actually I have another ask for our audience. Um, we want to spend some time thinking about sort of how people with disabilities uh, are treated such that their sexual development is different. So I was wondering if we could all spend a minute or so thinking about ways that sexuality, thinking about sexual development and what do we think is universal for everyone across the board when it comes to uh, sexual development. So it's like 1026, we'll give you all a couple of minutes to think. Um, Talcott, I wonder if you can chime in and let folks know if they wanted to type something and whether that should be into the Q&A or the chat box. Yeah, if you would prefer that your um, typing not be shared in the chat with all attendees and panelists, you can send that over as a Q&A. Okay. And it, I believe the Q&A settings as of right now, um, those questions will only be seen by Claire, Wesley, and myself. So uh, if, if you prefer that more private route, then that's fine. But um, it sounds like Claire and Wesley, you would like us participants to maybe share our thoughts on this question here. The what yeah. is the same, what is different? Okay, cool. So yeah, folks want to just spend a couple minutes thinking about sort of what's the same and what's different around sexual development. And we'll yeah. give you a minute on that.
Okay, so I see someone wrote uh, comprehension. Um, I'm, I'm thinking you meant that in terms of sort of, uh, that's, a, that's a difference that people have. Um, I'm gonna sort of talk about that. If I'm wrong, feel free to correct me if, I, um, if I'm misperceiving what you're writing. Um, comprehension in terms of um, making education accessible is absolutely something, is, there's ab absolutely a, a difference there in terms of, um, of how, what kind of education we give people. Um, yeah, absolutely. Stigma, uh, stigma and, and just a lack of accessible education, totally. Yes, I'm so happy. Everyone's uh, with it already. Okay, so um, let's start talking about, oh gosh, there's even more. Okay. Uh, yes. Okay, thank you, Rebecca Millman. Okay, so <laughs> I'm so happy about this. So many good responses. Oh yeah, this is great. Yes. So, um, so far, everyone who's who's chimed in is kind of ahead of the curve here. So, a big thing that we're going to talk about is that a lot of the differences around sexuality or how we treat people with disabilities. So, um, so everybody, regardless of whether or not they're disabled, um, is assigned a gender when they're born. So that's sort of step one. Um, we don't have to get into it too much, but essentially the doctor is going to look at your genitals when you're born and based on kind of what they see, they're going to make a distinction and they, you know, might be right, they might be wrong, but they're going to assign you a gender. Um, and as someone has pointed out, the, um, the way that we teach gender, the way we socialize people with disabilities to have a gender is um, is different sometimes. So we work with some people with disabilities that have said that they they were assigned male at birth, for example, and no one ever expected them to be a provider for their family because they're, they, they were assigned, they're disabled, and no one expected them as a disabled man to be able to, to provide or be super strong or be super aggressive. And so um, we're all assigned a gender when we're born, but certainly some people with disabilities have a different experience in what people expect from them because of their disability. But we all are assigned a gender. Um, and um, just like uh, non-disabled people, disabled people can be transgender or intersex or, or anything there as well. Um, all people, regardless of whether or not they're disabled, experience um, a desire for intimacy. So not um, sometimes people are asexual, sometimes disabled people are asexual, and sometimes non-disabled people are asexual. But we believe that everybody desires intimacy in some form. Um, and a lot of people with disabilities are, are, are sexual. Um, everybody has aspirations and goals. So um, disabled and non-disabled, Oh, I see a question of what, can you explain this? Um, can you, what was that in reference to? I'm happy to, to, to dive in a little bit more. Um, yes, okay, so I'm gonna keep going and then. Yeah, okay, so humans being asexual. So yes, I'm happy to dive into this. So um, when people, regardless of whether they're disabled or not, um, can have, a sexual orientation, so they could be heterosexual, they could be gay, they could be bisexual, they could be asexual. So asexual means that they do not have the desire to have sexual connections with people. That doesn't mean that they don't desire intimacy and don't necessarily, it doesn't, they might desire intimacy and they might desire romance, but they don't necessarily desire sexual relationships. Um, that's Sometimes disabled people are asexual and sometimes non-disabled people are asexual. Um, there exists a pervasive notion, a stereotype that people with disabilities are asexual. And so I, I always feel the need to mention that, I always feel the need to break that down and point out that people with disabilities are sexual. Oh, I see, okay. Um, but but yes, yeah, sometimes people with disabilities are asexual. Um, I think also what this person is asking um, is sort of whether someone's born uh, intersex, which we can also get into a little bit. Sometimes folks, regardless of disabled or non-disabled, uh, are, are, have, are, um, I don't know, I feel like I'm getting into the weeds a little <laughs> bit with this. 
Um, I'll tell you what, I want to take that question. Yes, thank you, Talcott. Yeah, I, I think that one I think I want to save to the end. But everybody is assigned a gender when they're born, um, whether or not that is the, the, the gender that they feel and grow up to be. Um, and people also have a sexual orientation. Um, and so they could be gay, they could be lesbian, they could be bisexual, they could be asexual, they could be heterosexual. And that's different from their gender. I apologize if, uh, if I conflated those and, and got a little confusing there. So to take a step back, everybody, regardless of whether they're disabled or not, is assigned a gender. Um, and everybody experiences a need for intimacy. So sometimes uh, people are asexual, but usually people are not asexual. And that's worth keeping in mind for disabled people too. Um, everybody has aspirations. So everybody is interested in, you know, um, goals for their future. And those are different um, for everybody. But a lot of my students would like to get married someday or have a baby someday and have a career. And that's also worth keeping in mind. Um, all people go through puberty and have physical developmental milestones. So, I mean, whenever I do this workshop for, for parents of teenagers, everybody kind of sighs along. Um, everybody goes through puberty. I think there also exists this pervasive notion that people with disabilities, especially developmental disabilities, are, are childlike. Um, there's a lot of infantilization that happens. So we uh, really want to make sure that we keep in mind that all of the puberty that all of us went through when we were younger, people with disabilities are going through that too. Um, which means that they are probably having sexual urges just like non-disabled teenagers have, which means that everybody, regardless of whether or not they're disabled, needs education about accessing safe sex. Um, and that needs to be made more accessible, but the same information is needed for everyone. I just wanted to point out something that Rebecca mm -hmm. just said in the chat, which I think is absolutely true. People with intellectual and developmental disabilities are questioned more when they try to express yes. a queer or trans identity. Um, and they're often told like exactly what you're saying. Yes. You're too disabled to know who you are. Um, and that's a big bias that um, we're working really hard to yeah. prevent. <laughs> um, I just want to say also, this is anecdotal. I, I see this like all I, I see this in so many different kinds of families too. So, I mean, I've had parents tell me um, that their child who has Down syndrome, uh, you know, they say that they're trans, but they can't be trans because they have Down syndrome. So they're probably just a lesbian. Like that's a conversation that I've had before. I've also had families say, you know, this person's like too intellectually disabled to, to know about their gender or sexuality. Um, and that's even true when people are not intellectually disabled. I've met people that are autistic, um, but, um, but are not cognitively impacted. And still that assumption has been made on them that they're not capable of making that choice or that they've somehow been like manipulated into being trans or queer. And so I do think that that's really true. Um, and I think it's all the more important to be like supporting people um, when they express their identities, um, keeping in mind that, that that has been invalidated. So thank you for saying that. Um, okay, so I wanna spend a couple minutes sort of talking about what is going to be different in the ways that we socialize people with disabilities. Um, so <laughs> everything everyone said is true. I really wanna to get to all of this. Um, people with developmental disabilities experience social isolation, um, and this happens in a variety of different ways, just from how we segregate people with disabilities, um, but also just in relationships. A lot of people with developmental disabilities report loneliness and, and feeling isolated. Um, and as you can imagine, that, that really makes, that puts someone at risk of experiencing sexual violence and, and relationship violence. Um, People with developmental disabilities, and especially intellectual disabilities, often um, don't have the same access to privacy that non-disabled people do. So experts suggest that children should be learning about the concept of privacy when they're young children. So around four or five, your child should really sort of know what it means for something to be private and should be able to have a place where they can access privacy. Um, a lot of people with disabilities have medical complexities or other needs such that being alone is not safe for them. They might need supervision, they might need intimate personal care, um, but just because there is so much more help going on in the lives of people with disabilities, there's often less privacy. Um, 
this is a major this this is a major risk factor for for sexual violence um having having a place where you can be alone and know that that's going to be respected is a really important it's really important for your skill development around privacy um people with developmental disabilities also um, experience um a lot of compliance conditioning so my belief is that we do a terrible job teaching about consent in our society in general for everyone but that is especially true when it comes to people with disabilities um, we see this in our class all the time that like I will be teaching my students about consent and I'll be teaching them that people don't get to touch them without their permission and like as I am saying that a paraeducator will be like touching someone's body or pulling their shirt down or just sort of physically prompting them somehow. So this is something we see in school settings, we see in home life, we see so, so much. Um, it's, it, it's just really frustrating because we can teach people that no means no as much, we can say that as over and over again, but if that's not respected by the people in that person's life, it's, it's really um, difficult to kind of get that message in. So. And this emphasis on compliance is a major, major um, issue. A lot of people with disabilities need more explicit social cues to be successful when they're socializing. So we talked about this before, that idioms and sarcasm and figurative language can sometimes go over people's heads. Um, and so sort of those kind of more passive or more inferred social cues can be a little bit um, difficult. Um, and then sort of, Another thing is that a lot of times inappropriate behavior is kind of permitted by non-disabled people. So something I see a lot is my, um, my a, a student with a developmental disability will go up and hug someone who's a stranger or even just someone who it's not appropriate for them to be hugging. Um, and a lot of non-disabled people will just kind of accept that. They'll say like, oh, he's, he's, he's fine. He's disabled. It's okay. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of like permissive stuff happening. Um, and I think something my co-educator likes to say is like nine out of 10 times, if an adult with a disability goes up and gives a stranger a hug, the stranger's gonna be like, oh no, it's fine, they're disabled. But like 10% of the time, someone is not going to be okay with that. Um, and so all of those other times that that inappropriate behavior was permitted um, is really contributing to a lack of safety for that person, if that makes sense. Um, and I've I, kind of an interesting anecdote about this. We have a, a colleague who's autistic and they said that they used to have a job. They used to work in a restaurant where they used to touch their coworkers hair all the time. And that one day it clicked with them that the only reason their coworker was letting them do that is because they perceived them as disabled. And they had this aha moment of like, oh, I don't want this person to be like letting me, um, violate their boundaries just because they perceive me in this certain way. So I'm going to stop doing that. Um, so I just think it's kind of an interesting observation that's that, you know, people with disabilities are well aware of, of this dynamic as well. Um, people with disabilities also have more helper relationships in their life. That's what we call them in our class. So they have more paid staff. Um, and with that comes more relationships in their life where there's a power differential. So um, someone who needs support, uh, caregiver support with their activities of daily living, um, that person has more people in their life that have power over them, um, and that can make people less safe. Um, and lastly, people with disabilities have less access to formal and informal sex education. There was some research that came out that said, a majority of special ed teachers did not feel that their students needed sex education, and also that a majority of students with and special ed did not receive special uh, did not receive sex education, so it's something where it's not happening, and also people a lot of the people in the lives of disabled people are not seeing a need for this, um, so it's it's a it's a big issue. Um, Okay, I kind of just want to read through these comments a little bit. Um, I do, I do really appreciate what people were saying, sort of about this idea that um, when people with disabilities do assert a sexuality or a gender identity, that that is often sort of disregarded or invalidated somehow. Um, and I also just want to echo the sentiment that the way that people um, are socialized in their gender expression is 
is often a function of their disability. So like I said before, um, disabled boys are less expected to be breadwinners or providers, um, and disabled women are less accepted to be, expected to be nurturers um, or, or those other kind of gendered stereotypes that we have. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's complex. Okay. Uh, cool, thank you everyone. All right, so now we're gonna talk about some statistics. Um, and I know that statistics are often like very depressing and it's just like a lot of numbers, but I want to remember that like these are real people and that's a lot of people. So first off, there are one in four people in the United States who have a disability um, and about 1.4% of the population has an intellectual or developmental disability, which you might be like surprised by. I sure was. I feel like people with IDD are really pushed to the margins of our society and you don't necessarily interact with them at school because they're se like separated into a special education track and then they're pushed out of the workforce so you might not be seeing them in your daily life but that's a lot that's like one to two people in every hundred people in the, in the United States. Um, Next, we're gonna talk about sexual violence. So people with intellectual and developmental disabilities experience sexual violence at three to seven times the rate of the general population. Um, and we know that there's a lot of um, difficulty getting accurate statistics about, the, um, about sexual violence because it's underreported and people are often disbelieved, especially people with disabilities. Um, and there's a lot of variance, so there's a lot of variance in these numbers, but, uh, this one study um, found that almost um, about 83% of women and 32% of men with developmental disabilities are survivors of sexual assault. Yeah, that's a lot, a lot of people. Like it's more common for women with d developmental disability to be sexually assaulted than not. And that's just really horrifying um, and something to keep in mind when working with this population. Um, also, like who who is doing this? So about half, like 49% of the people who are doing abusing these folks are uh, professionals. They're care providers, like teachers, uh, paid caregivers, therapists, bus drivers, um, and then the other half are family members, family friends, or personal friends. And looking at that, like oh, there are almost no strangers in this mix. Um, and part of that is because these folks are so isolated from the rest of the community. Um, but also these people are often people who the person should trust. And these are people who continue often to have access to this person and are able to abuse them over a longer period of time. Um, and so like thinking about the impact that not just like one instance of sexual assault, but repeated abuse by like a caregiver might have on someone is a really important thing to keep in mind when working with survivors. Yeah. All right. So we wanted to um, really center the voices of some of the folks who have experienced this violence. Um, and I'm gonna give y'all a little bit of like a content warning. We're gonna talk about some stuff. Um, we tried to select things that weren't um, like extremely graphic, but if the, you're not wanting to hear about this today, like go ahead and like mute us until we're done with this slide. Um, because we thought that it was important to, to acknowledge like the real the real experiences that some people have. Um, so the, the main themes that came up, there were four women with intellectual disability who were interviewed for this study, and they talked a lot about not belonging, wanting to belong, and then experiencing domestic violence when they were in relationship. Um, and so I'm gonna read a little bit of uh, in, an excerpt from this interview with someone named Louise. Um, and if you guys wanna read more about this person's experience, um, I really recommend checking out this study. So the interviewer asks, how did you feel about your relationship with your dad? And Louis says, quite hurt, because I was always my dad's little girl, you know? I was the apple of my dad's eye. I was always my dad's little girl. How did you feel when he asked you to leave? Another rejection. I was always rejected by my dad. When it suited my dad for me to be in his life, I was in his life. When it didn't suit him, I wasn't in his life. So it was another one that didn't want me. What did you say? Oh, so when did you say it was another one who didn't want you? Who else didn't want you? Well, my mom and the foster homes. I knew she didn't care. If she cared, she would have done something. But she did not. When I was out of control, she used an electrical cord or a broom or a wooden spoon on me. So I knew I would get a smack one way or another. 
and I, I didn't get us back and she wouldn't, she couldn't handle me. So she'd throw me away. That's how it felt. It was like me going in the garbage bin. All I knew was I wasn't wanted by my parents. I wasn't wanted. And the interviewer continues. So how did you feel? Um, the interview continues um, and Louise is speaking about what happened after her father's death and she's still questioning whether he ever loved her or not. So the interviewer asks, how did you feel about that? And Louise says, unanswered. There's a big gap there, not knowing if my dad loved me. It's back to square one again. I don't know why my dad chose not to help me. See, I wrote to him and I said I was being sexually abused in foster homes. I wrote to him and he knew my stepfather raped me. Everything was left to him and I got no answer back. And then the interviewer asks, how did that make you feel that he knew everything that was going on? Louise says, he chose to do nothing. It hurt. I'm still to this day cut up knowing that my dad chose, knew and chose not to do anything. Um, so that's, that's a little bit of Louise's story. And then um, another person from this study named Gloria um, talks about being placed in an institution and not understanding why. She was about 10. And eventually she figured out that she was removed from her parents um, and put in this institution because of her disability. And she was really miserable there. And she says, uh, yeah, I knew I had a disability. And we couldn't remember why we were taken away from our mom because we had plenty of food and I couldn't figure it out. When I got older, I thought, well, where are they going to put us? Because I was 10 years old and I thought, oh, I just want to get out of here. So I'll just get married. Um, yeah. So I think in that we can see how pervasive um, this feeling of isolation is. Um, and yeah, this, this kind of need for belonging is so, um, so fundamental. Um, I'm going to read a little bit, a couple of quotes about sort of what belonging means to, to Louise. Um, she said, her kids belong to me. She said, my kids belong to me. And that's a feeling I get that I'm loved by my children unconditionally. My boys love me, even though sometimes they tell me they don't want to be with me, but they are with me and I love them. Um, another person from this study said, he just makes me feel, he makes me feel special and makes me feel, even though he doesn't love me the same way, because he's told me that. It makes me feel special. It makes me feel wanted. You know, it makes me feel as though someone does care about me. So I think in these anecdotes, we can see how uh, pervasive this feeling of loneliness and isolation is um, and how, how harmful that is and how that can really put people at risk. Um, yeah, I, I just sort of anecdotally to, to add to that too, something that we've seen is other kind of inappropriate or not inappropriate, other unsafe behaviors that people get into are often sort of um, a way of looking for belonging. Um, so we've worked with folks that um, end up kind of getting into drugs and it's not that they, they weren't, that the reason that they started getting into drugs was because they were looking for, so looking for belonging and looking for acceptance within a group of people. and kind of doing this unsafe behavior is the way to achieve that. So it is, I mean, I think our, our supervisor calls it an epidemic of, of isolation and of loneliness. And I feel like that is not an, un, an overstatement. Um, and I just wanted to uh, highlight, like, as these people receive like repeated rejection and experience domestic violence, um, that like builds on top of the ableism and sexism that they've already experienced in the world. And so their, um, their understanding of what's happening to them is like very impacted by that. And um, I just want to be very clear that like it is not their fault. <laughs> um, yeah. It is always the fault of the abuser, but that um, it can be extra hard for these people to find valid, like validation and meaning for their lives outside of the roles of like wife or mother because so uh, so many other options have been cut off mm -hmm. for them um, that they really cling to the sense of meaning and purpose in life even when it's very harmful for them so part of helping them um, find their way out of domestic mm -hmm. violence is making sure that they have those mm -hmm. those like handles mm -hmm. yeah okay um so We've talked a little bit about sort of the different factors that make people uniquely unsafe. Um, and so we want to talk a little bit about that. Um, my understanding is that the people listening in on this uh, are support, support people who have experienced sexual assault. So I think some of these, uh, some of these 
sort of what we can do things, I, you're certainly limited by your role in that person's life, um, but hopefully some of this can be helpful. So we've talked a lot about how people with disabilities are devalued um, by our society. And so, I mean, just fundamentally from a starting point, building a culture of respect for people with disabilities, um, like we said, you know, um, accommodating their needs, being respectful, um, treating them, you know, like adults, if they are adults, um, really goes a long way to building rapport and building respect with someone. Um, people with disabilities are seen as easy targets. Um, we do not listen to people with disabilities when they report sexual violence. Um, and a lot of that is that people don't have the language to talk about it. So comprehensive and accessible information about sexuality um, helps people be safer. We just know this. So um, there are, our program is doing education. I know probably a lot of you folks work for organizations that are doing some education about relationships or some prevention work around relationships. Um, so just making that as accessible as possible um, helps people be safer. Um, when people with disabilities do report abuse, um, the average response is nothing. Um, I, we see this statistically and anecdotally that um, when people do report violence, it's swept under the rug. So a big part of that is, like we said, education, giving people the language to talk about their bodies. If people know the words penis, if they know the word vulva, they're going to have an easier time talking about um, talking about it if something is wrong. Um, so yeah, one is just sort of uh, one piece of advice is using anatomically appropriate language, um, which I would imagine is uh, already kind of your practice in your work, but making sure that we're not using like baby words to talk about our bodies is really important um, so that people with disabilities are understood um, and taken seriously when they do report violence. And the other half of that is, and again, I can imagine this is already your practice at your job, but when people do report violence, taking that seriously and believing them. Um, and helping them get connected. Um, people with developmental disabilities are isolated. So just helping people be a part of their communities. Um, something I see when I do workshops for staff at like rec centers um, or, or other, other places where people work with people with disabilities is they kind of feel like the onus is on them to be that person's friend. Um, and I would contend that that is not helpful um, and kind of falls into that moral model of disability of feeling like you're a good person uh, for helping them. Really, uh, the best thing that you can do to help someone who's isolated is help them find a community, um, whether that's helping them build the skills to have successful social relationships or whether that's helping them find people who share interests with them. Um, also, um, the, the problem is hidden. So, I mean, we have these really pervasive stereotypes that disabled people are asexual or that they're sexually deviant or that they are not capable of making choices about who they are and what they want. Um, and that, that those are all dehumanizing and they all contribute to a culture of, of disability sort of being an afterthought. Um, another big conversation that ties into this is this idea that disabled people don't have the capacity to consent to sex, um, which is a, a really complicated topic. I think consent is, there's so much that goes into that. But, um, but again, a lot of people with disabilities are informed about sex and are um, making informed uh, choices around consent. And that's important to keep in mind too. Um, and then lastly, I cannot overstate uh, what an issue this compliance conditioning is. So one of the most helpful things that you can do for your clients is respecting when they say no to things. Um, like I said, I see some really upsetting stuff when I go into classrooms and when I go into other places where, where there are disabled people kind of being touched without their permission, having their boundaries disrespected. Um, so I am just huge on like thanking people when they say no to me or when they share a boundary um, and just really reminding the people that you work with that they're allowed to say no to things that they don't like or that they don't want or that scare them um, is so important. Um, yeah, I think that was all I had to say about that. Awesome. Cool. Next up, we have this power and control wheel. I hope you all are familiar with power and control wheels, um, but 
uh, in case you're not, I really encourage you to check this one out and also like other power and control wheels. This one is specific to people with disabilities and their caregivers. So basically the way this works is that the abuser uses all of these sort of like slices of this wheel like to make, to like enforce their control and, and like reinforce their power over the person. Um, and there's a lot here, um, but I just wanna highlight a few things. So a lot of these are the same, um, regardless of whether the um, person who's being abused has a disability or not. But there are a couple that are really unique. So um, with coercion and threats, one of the um, most dangerous things that a caregiver can do is leave. So if the person is um, relying on them for support, like to make meals or to take them to the bathroom and that person decides I'm done, I'm gonna walk off the shift, you're gonna be alone for eight hours. That can be like a life-threatening situation for that person. Um, and so the person with the disability is really um, at a disadvantage when the person is threatening to do something like that. Um, also, um, part of the caregiver privilege it can involve this sort of like dehumanizing that we've talked about, like treating the person as a child, um, violating their privacy, um, especially important if the person is providing like uh, personal care that requires the like that involves the person being like naked or help with showers or um, dressing that like it needs to be clear like this is when I'm helping you with this specific task and then in these other ways you have complete right to like your privacy. Um, those professional boundaries are really important. Um, yeah, economic abuse is especially impactful for people with disabilities who often live on um, social security benefit and like have like very limited income to begin with. So any misuse of their money can really um, like wreak havoc on their on their finances. Um, in terms of withholding, misusing, or delaying support, um, one of the more um, sneaky ways that this is done can often be involving using like psych medication to like sedate people if you don't like their behavior, um, which happens a lot in institutions. And then um, I'm gonna skip over a couple of these just for the sake of time, but please do read them. Um, I wanted to come back to um, this thing about minimizing, justifying, and blaming, because I think that this is um, one of the most detrimental and most like pervasive ways in which people with disabilities are blamed for their abuse. Um, there are a lot of instances of caregivers killing the people that they're caring for, especially parents. Um, and a lot of times the conversation about that murder centers around the caregiver stress and caregiver burnout and how do we need to support parents better so they don't try to murder their children. And that's gross. Like there should never be like excuse making for murder of other people. Um, the person with the disability absolutely did nothing to deserve being murdered. And like that sort of rhetoric is really, really harmful. And um, this is not to say like there shouldn't ever be a conversation about caregiver burnout, but that the conversation is completely one-sided and that people with disabilities do not like com like murder their caregivers. Like that's not a thing that happens. Um, and so the fact that like these conversations continue to be focused on like caregiver stress, even when people are um, dying is like not not the way that the conversation should be going. So, yeah. I, I yeah no. I also just I want to reiterate what Wesley said. I think it's really interesting that I I do think caregiving is um, a really difficult job that like is undervalued by by our society. And I just want to reiterate that I think it's very frustrating that it the conversation about caregiver fatigue happens like it flares up after there's an incident where a caregiver murders their client or their child. Um, and so, yeah, I just want to reiterate that I think there is so much need for like caregiver support. It's just unfortunate that that like the time we choose to have that conversation is after there's been a, an unjust murder. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. So I think that um, when thinking about caregivers, there's just there's um, just so much power in that relationship that is really unique from other relationships. And um, I think that we, we always need to be aware that like there's there's not justification for any sort of abuse, but that when you have that much power over someone else's life, it's really easy to do some of these things, even if you don't mean to. And that like acknowledging that and stopping is like the most important bit um, that we all need to be aware of all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool.
Oh, wait, oh, one more sorry. thing. <laughs> sorry. Um, I was going to read you a, a couple more um, like anecdotes, but I wanted to point out this, um, this uh, blog post by Mel Baggs called Caregiver Abuse, Abuse Takes Many Forms. Um, and in it, she's a disability self-advocate. She lists this whole wheel. She goes through like 10 pages of examples from her life. Um, and a lot of them are really, really interesting and unique and like subtle in ways that um, I would love to be able to get into, but can't because <laughs> I would like to get to the rest of the presentation. So I really encourage you to check that out um, and like take care of yourself while you do it. It's upsetting. Yeah. Um, so we want to talk about this briefly. Um, something we get a lot of questions about are where guardians fall into fall into all of this. So first, I have to say that I am not a lawyer, and this is not legal advice, um, but I can tell you a little bit about the Arc of King County's uh, kind of perspective on this. So when you are interviewing someone with a disability uh, who's a survivor of sexual violence or, or uh, intimate partner violence, um, it's, it's worth keeping in mind that caregivers and guardians um, and other sort of helpers in that person's life, um, they have a lot of power over them and they're often the perpetrators of, um, of violence. So if possible, it's best to speak with the person alone. Um, of course, if they wish to have another person there, that should be honored, um, but it's, that's worth keeping in mind. Um, also, um, just as if you were speaking to someone who was deaf, um, all questions and all sort of conversation should be directed towards the person with a disability. Um, even if the person who's with them, even if their caregiver is um, maybe like explicating sort of what they're saying in, an, in a way that's easier for you to understand or if they're doing a little bit of sort of translating, um, it's, it's still respectful and best practice to be um, looking at and communicating with the person with the disability who's the survivor. Um, some people with disabilities do not do well with open-ended questions. So saying, you know, um, what did you do for, for fun last night? Some people cannot answer that question. They do better with um, kind of an A or B option. Um, I, you are probably all like thinking about uh, that kind of the potential for like a leading question within that. So if I'm saying, you know, um, who hurt you? Was it your mom or your dad, right? That's a super leading question. So something that we will do is offer kind of an open-ended, multiple choice with an open-ended last option. So what did you eat for dinner last night? Did you eat pizza, pasta, a hamburger, or something else? And if they pick something else, you can kind of keep going down that line until you kind of get the information that you're looking for. So that is, there are lots and lots of ways to, that people with disabilities communicate. Um, one thing that we find helpful is that sort of open-ended question and then kind of trying to offer more options within that. Um, so as far as what we do, if someone we're supporting has, um, discloses that they're in an abusive relationship to us um, and they have a guardian, the Arc of King County, our policy is that we do not automatically disclose relationships to guardians, um, even if they are abusive or unhealthy. Um, we have very strict reporting guide guidelines. Um, we're mand mandatory reporters. So we, when we make calls to APS or CPS, we are not necessarily going to be calling the guardian with that person because that might not be safe for that person. Um, we don't know who the guardian sh guardian's involvement. So we take it on a case-by-case -case basis. We work with the person with a disability to decide if disclosing is the right thing for them, is what they want. Um, and that's what we do. So I'm not gonna say we never call guardians, but generally speaking, we try to have that person be help support them to make an informed choice about what's best for them. Um, but these, comp these situations are always very complicated, so it really does depend. Um, yeah, and I'm sort of curious uh, what, what different organizations have on that. So it's, if that's something, if you're not sure sort of what, what, you're, what you would do if, if a guardian gets involved, it's worth checking in with your team and kind of making sure that you have a plan for that. Okay, um, so the next thing we wanted to talk about is sort of just working, working with people with developmental disabilities, kind of um, some tips just conversationally. So like we said, um, being, being respectful, um, like we said, communicating with the person directly and not with maybe the person who's helping interpret or the person who's supporting them. 
um, talking to them like they're an adult, um, not something that is surprisingly pervasive among professionals is uh, speaking in like a baby voice. Um, that's kind of one of my personal pet peeves. So that's why I'm calling it out. But um, just kind of, even if the person needs you to speak a little bit slower, um, there isn't really any need for like a sing song voice when you're talking to someone with a disability. So just being respectful and treating them like a person. Um, making sure that your environment is accessible um, and safe. So there's a lot, um, I can imagine a lot of you work in places with locations that can't be publicly disclosed. Um, so just working, doing what you need to do to make sure that people with disabilities are able to access you um, physically, like get to you if they need to, but also um, making sure that you're accessible to, to reach out to. Um, having sort of plain and accurate language is helpful. So um, sometimes folks, if, if you say something and that the person isn't quite understanding it, you might want to break it down into language that's a little bit more plain or a little bit more simple. I think one way you could think about it is um, depending on the person, like a fourth grade reading level or a sixth grade reading level is kind of a probably appropriate um, vocabulary um, if, if you're having a conversation with someone. Um, but again, it's, I mean, it's, it's just always worth kind of keeping in mind, you, you can use language that is more plain um, without being like condescending. And so I just think one thing we really want to hammer home is that people with disabilities are infantilized so much that we really want to make sure that we're not treating them like kids. Um, so the next point kind of comes in with that, clear instructions. Um, sometimes folks need to, to like smaller steps broken down or sometimes folks need one step at a time. So a lot of folks we work with, um, you can't necessarily say, okay, you're gonna go to the microwave, you're gonna unwrap the food and you're gonna put it in the microwave and set it for four minutes. They need kind of one by one steps. Um, so kind of keeping that in mind, or conversely, um, just telling someone to go microwave something might not work. You might need to break it down into more slow steps. Um, in line with that, kind of not rushing them. Um, we mentioned that some people have processing delays, so if people need a few minutes after you ask a question, kind of learning to be comfortable with awkward silence uh, so that it isn't so awkward is, is a good thing. Um, and then kind of the last, the the, the last thing we want to say is um, to assume competence. So like we said, we'll start off by saying, uh, I will kind of start a conversation pretty openly and then gauge that person's ability to understand what I'm talking about and kind of adjust from there. Um, but just generally speaking, assume competence. Um, and lastly, that everybody communicates even if they don't speak. So just because somebody doesn't use their voice doesn't mean that they don't use um, used a variety of other methods to communicate. All right, now we're gonna talk a little bit about how we can improve therapy and intervention. So people with disabilities are often um, told that they're not disabled enough. And so if someone comes to you and is saying like, I need this accessibility uh, like accommodation or uh, this is not working for me, um, please just believe them about their disability. Um, even if they don't seem disabled, and especially if they don't seem disabled to you, um, disclosing a disability is a real sign of trust. And so um, believing them about their disability can go a long way to like build that rapport. And also to help them um, communicate clearly with you uh, about what they need. Also, people with disabilities often um, like experience emotions and embody emotions differently. So um, if someone is, telling you that they're having uh, mental health problems like if they're being if they're feeling very anxious or depressed um, they might be experiencing like atypical symptoms they might not look like what you uh, commonly see with someone who's depressed or anxious or experiencing PTSD um, and I think it's really important to believe them when they talk about their mental health um, because a lot of times they're invalidated and told like mm, no I don't I don't I don't think you're quite right about that <laughs> um, Another thing is that a ton of resources aimed at people with disability are written for children. And it is very infantilizing and discouraging to be like, here, I found this great resource about helping yourself with like your sensory needs. It's, it's for parents or like it's aimed at five-year-olds and you're like, I'm 20. Um, that's really, really um, 
difficult for adults. So if you need to give resources to adults, please make sure that they are for adults and not aimed at children or caregivers. Um, also, do your best to educate yourself about the person, uh, about disability in general, so that the person is not having to explain as much to you about their identity, um, just as you would for any other like cultural difference or um, yeah, any other sort of difference. Um, I just wanted to mention that suicide is a really significant concern for people with intellectual and developmental disability. So any, like, please screen for suicidality um, and like do refer people to treatment. Like mental health treatment can be impactful for these folks. Um, even with limited verbal skills, we know a lot of how people process trauma is nonverbal and can be done through like embodied practice or art therapy, um, which absolutely is like going to help these people um, that you're working with like in their recovery from their mental health um, condition and, and healing from trauma. So I would encourage you also to think about how our current mental health system is set up for nonverbal people. I think that it's really difficult for those folks to access talk therapy um, because of the like slower time it takes for them to like use a communication, an alternate communication tool to verbalize um, what's going on in their, in their mind. Um, so yeah, that's, that's just a reflection question for you. Did I'll you just see think Rebecca's about. question? You kind of started. Uh, I wonder if you have thoughts on that. Yeah, let me. Um, so this this article that I pulled a lot of this from is specifically about autistic people recounting their experiences with mental health, um, with mental health treatment. But we have a couple other resources that I didn't reference in this slide that I would be, I can look at and then send your way later. But I don't know if there's like a gold standard. I don't think there's been like a ton of research done with this population because there just like is barely enough money for services, let alone for research. Yeah, um, Rebecca, to, to answer your question, I don't really know because I'm not a therapist. What I could do though is I am aware of a couple, there are not a lot unfortunately, but there are a few mental health providers that specialize in working with people with DD and trauma um, and or autism and trauma. So I... I'm also kind of wondering similar thing myself. The, the question is sort of best practices or research-based adaptations for, for survivors with IDD in terms of accessing trauma treatment. Um, so I'm, I'm have kind of, I'm wondering similar things and I will, um, if you'd like, I'd love to connect you with some, some therapists who might be able to tell you a little bit more about that. Cool. Thank you. Um, That's a great question. Yes. Okay. Next. Yeah, hold on, I'm gonna write that down to myself, but so yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, thank you everyone for hanging in there. <laughs> um, okay, so we kind of went over this a couple minutes ago, but just to sort of reiterate some skills or some, some tools that you can utilize to sort of help uh, work with people who have disabilities around kind of reinforcing uh, these deficits that we've talked about, right? We have this emphasis on compliance and we don't give people with disabilities privacy and, and things like that. So how can we start to undo some of that? So around sort of consent and boundaries and sort of helping teach those skills, um, like we said, thanking that person when they do share a boundary and letting them know that they get to say no is huge. Um, as much as you're able to in your position sort of helping make sure that the other professionals and adults in that person's life are also asking for permission before they're touching them in routine and non-routine ways. So if that person is getting bathroom support, um, the person who's helping them in the bathroom needs to be asking for consent and checking in every step of the way. Um, and that's also true for every other professional in their life. So as much as you're able to kind of advocate for that, um, that goes a really long way. Um, in terms of choice, um, just to kind of give you a sense, sometimes I work with students where we start talking about sort of having choices in a relationship and my way of checking a baseline of kind of like how, how much do my students understand that this concept of choice is I'll ask them, who can think of a choice you made today? And we'll think about who chose what you ate for breakfast, who picked out the shirt that you're wearing, and we try to come up with some really basic choices. 
I have had students who have literally no concept of what it is to make a choice because their parents picked out their shirt, picked out every meal that they eat. And so sort of giving options uh, within, within sort of activities that you're doing is a good way to sort of start building that skill. Um, if someone doesn't understand the concept of, of choice, um, I think we can all understand that that's a huge uh, indicator of risk. So helping people have choices, if you're working with someone and they're not, they're, that they're, you know, if there's a mandatory task that needs to happen, if you're driving someone and they need to wear a seatbelt, um, you can kind of create choices within that, right? Um, we can say, I will buckle, buckle your seatbelt or you can buckle your seatbelt, but it needs to get buckled. So what are we gonna do about that? So as much as you're able to kind of build choices into everything, that's also a helpful skill to develop. Um, assertiveness kind of ties into that compliance piece. So like really encouraging them to say no to things they don't like and thanking them when they do say no to things is, um, is a great way to kind of build confidence. Um, and as I'm sure we know, uh, having, having higher self-esteem and assertiveness and self-advocacy skills is correlated to being safer. Um, and lastly, one of uh, a really, really common issue that we see is we'll get calls from parents saying, you know, my child is like masturbating at school or, you know, that that's actually a really common thing we get is like my child is like doing something private in a public place. Um, and what do I do about it? The first thing that we ask when we get a call like that is, does your child have a place where they can expect privacy? And usually the answer is no. So, um, you know, even if you're the person shares a bedroom with someone, um, sort of identifying a place where they can go, the bathroom with the locked door, having a place where they can go to be alone for a to, to sort of do whatever they need to do is really important. Um, that's also a big safety safety skill. So as much as you're able to kind of support having those kind of healthy relationships dynamics in that person's life, that can help them be safer. Um, so the last thing we wanted to do is just tell you a little bit about our program. Um, so we are at the Arc of King County. Um, we are the Healthy Relationships Program. The bulk of what we do is a 10-week uh, curriculum that we teach in transition programs throughout King County. Um, and we also do workshops like this one for families and professionals and people with disabilities. Um, and then we also have a resource line. So you can call us or email us um, if you ever have questions, if you need information, if you need resources, even if you just need emotional support, you can call us um, about anything that we've talked about. You can call us about anything related to relationships, and or sexuality around disability. So sometimes people call us uh, for survivor resources, LGBT resources, information about puberty, uh, information about sort of teaching someone how to masturbate. I mean, just you name it. We, if it has anything tangentially to do with uh, relationships or sexuality, we are, um, we can help you or we can direct you to someone who can. Um, and all of our services are free. Um, we are contracted to work with people that live in King County. So um, if you're in King County, we are a, a resource for you. If you're outside of King County, feel free to reach out to us. And if we're not able to support you, we can find someone else who can, hopefully. Um, okay, so thank you for listening to us talk. This is our list of resources that we've, we've cited here. Um, this is all really great stuff that I encourage people to dive into. We have about 10 minutes left. Um, so this is a great time if folks have questions. I also just wanna thank you all for listening to us talk for the last 82 minutes. Um, yeah, 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 back to resources, yes. So <laughs> Hold on, how do I get back there? There we go. There we go. Thank so you. the question and answer box is open and for participants, if you look at the bottom kind of toolbar of your Zoom screen, you should see a Q&A box. If you click that, it'll pop up and you are welcome to ask a question that way, or you can use the chat feature. Oh, 
there we are, back to the resources. I just wanted to point something out. Uh, this second resource, Responding to Survivors with Autism Spectrum Disorders, includes a really helpful list of ways in which autistic people might respond to trauma, including like unusual responses they might have to first responders to a scene, or like ways of answering questions that might be confusing if you're trying to interview them, um, such as like repeating the last thing you said, no matter what it was. Um, which is obviously not necessarily indicative of their true answer. So I would encourage you to look through that. It's a, like a big PDF, but there's like a sidebar with those responses that it's really valuable. Mm -hmm. Wow, thank you. Um, I also encourage people to just do some research on that site. The National Sexual Violence Resource Center has some wonderful resources. You can order hard copies or print from them that will help you increase accessibility across your programs, your environmental spaces, um, lectures, workshops, et cetera. They've been doing really incredible work around that. Well, I wanna thank you, Claire and Wesley, I uh, really appreciate your work on this webinar. It was so informative. Thank and you. Thank you. as you both mentioned, you are from the ARC <laughs> of King County. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe that people have access now to your information should they wish to reach out. Yes. All participants who are registered will receive an email from Wixap today with a link to this recorded webinar. It can be revisited and also information about continuing education. If you are attending with somebody else today and you didn't register via our um, webinar registry, please email me your email address to talcott, T-A-L-C-O-T-T -T, at wcsap.org so that I can be sure to give you the continuing education credit you deserve for attending. Well, I'm going to close the webinar today and thank you again, Clara. Yeah, thank you so much. I do believe one person wanted you to oh. type your email out. But yes, I wanna thank everyone so much for, um, for joining us today. Thank you for um, you. And just as you can email Talcott, you can also email me. Um, if you ever have any questions, I'm happy to, uh, to discuss any of this further. Hooray. I'm glad people had a great experience. Yeah. yeah thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Yes. Take care.